Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. Welcome to today's program, a conversation with artists Manyaku Mashilo and Sheena Rose, moderated by San Francisco gallerist Jonathan Carver Moore. Manyako and Sheena both have works currently on view at MOAD in our exhibition Spectrum on Color and Contemporary Art, curated by MOAD's Chief of Curatorial and Public Programs, Kijo Lee. This exhibition interrogates how artists use color to guide our perception, a multi-generational and international group of contemporary Black artists illuminate the importance of color to both the form and content of their work. Before I turn things over to Jonathan, I will briefly introduce our guests and we'll include fuller bios in the chat and they can also be found on MOAD's website at moadsf.org. Manyaku Mashilo is a Cape Town based artist whose multidimensional practice encompasses mixed media painting, drawing and collage. Born in Limpopo in 1991, she addresses themes of spiritual identity, memory, ancestry, community and belonging. Mashilo draws on inspiration from photographic archives to build expansive scenes where imagined representatives of Blackness migrate through abstract liminal spaces. Sheena Rose is a visual artist with multidisciplinary practice such as paintings, drawings, performance art, new media, public art, and mixed media. Rose holds an MFA in studio art from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and currently lives and works in her hometown of Bridgetown, Barbados. Jonathan Carver Moore is the founder and director of Jonathan Carver Moore, a contemporary art gallery that specializes in working with emerging and established artists who are BIPOC, LGBTQ plus and women. So please join me in welcoming our three guests. And now I will turn it over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, Manyaku. Hi, Sheena. How are you both doing today? Hi, Jonathan. Pretty good. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Sheena. Um, hi. Let's start out. Uh, what was that, Sheena? No, I would say hi, Manyaku. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start out with telling everyone a little bit about where you are in the world right now. Who, who's going? Oh, um, hi. So I am in Cape Town right now, Cape Town, South Africa. And I am based in Bridgetown, Barbados. Nice. So Manyako, I think it's uh, evening time right now for you. So thank you for joining us here. And uh, it's probably early evening for you, right, Sheena? Yeah, it's probably, it's like around four, four o'clock, four something right now. Nice. Um, so can we just give everyone a little bit of background about you as artists? Can we talk about um, how you become the artist that you are today and what's influenced your work? Um, Sheena, do you want to start? Well, I'm sure. Um, when it was five, seven years old, the youngest I can remember, um, always was into art, used my small little bedroom as a gallery space. And then eventually I said that I want to be a cartoonist. And so I used to draw little comments to myself. And as I grew up, I went to Barbados Community College, did my associate degree, did my bachelor's degree. And my teacher said, you actually suit fine arts. And I was disappointed because I want to pursue cartoons and comics. But as I carry on doing art and get, receive my bachelor's, um, I did a hand-drawn animation. And then from the hand-drawn animation, looking at Bridgestone the everyday, I started to question the everyday of Barbadian space being from the Caribbean. And as time go by, I start looking at identity and culture and who I am and where I am from. So yeah, I, I really love art. And I, at this moment, still questioning and asking myself those questions all the time. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And Manyaka, how about you? Um, so my my background's in fashion design. My <laughs> My my oldest brother and I have two other, other siblings. I have three other siblings, and two of them are also um, fine artists. 
And my brother was the first to sort of venture out into wanting to be an artist. And, um, but my dad was like, no, not another artist. So I went and did um, fashion design um, initially because I, you know, my, um, I come from a, a long line of, of women who are um, seamstresses and who are involved in like um, making clothing and stuff. So that was where I got um, a lot of my um, knowledge about I mean during the course there was things about like art history and drawing and things like that and that's when I sort of started getting into like um, the interest in 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 painting and drawing and things like that um, yeah so my my background is fashion design but I think even during my course I always knew that I was um, gravitating more towards um, fine arts towards being a painter, um, my illustration, I killed it in illustration. So they were just like, you, uh, something was happening. And I think I always knew I was going to end up drawing or or making some sort of like visual thing because I also um, photographs and 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 pictures and portraits and things I, I really excelled in during that time. Um, so yeah, that's what my background is. And that's sort of like where... It started. Um, it's interesting that, you know, your background, Manyaku, with illustration and fashion is quite evident now when I look at your paintings. And mm. then for you, you know, you, know, you mentioned um, a lot of your uh, influence from being from Barbados is what I feel like I can see in your paintings as well. And since we have your works up right now, like for example, this one here, Capturing Gray, can we just talk about your use of color, the bright colors that I'm looking at here and the inspirations that you're pulling from? Is this strictly from Barbados? Could this also be inspiration from your travels? Can you give us a little bit more detail on what we're looking at right now on the screens? So with Capturing Gray, um, I know the slideshow is moving, but with Capturing Gray, I was there, um, I went to Dominica and, when I went to Dominica, I was surprised to see, even though we're only a half an hour flight, the lighting is different. The color is different. I was blown away by that. I know that Dominica is known for greenery and for bush and plants and so on. And Barbados is known for the beaches. So when I got there and I see this lighting, especially when I put the camera to prove to my best friend, I said, can't you see that lighting? It's very gray. And when she looked through the camera, she did see a gray tank. So I was wondering, did that come from the volcano? Did that come from the black sand? Because in Barbados, we have pink sand. And we have very, very blue sky, like a, like almost like this, but like a little later. Like. So I was just amazed that only a half an hour flight, there's so, like the colors are different. So when I did that piece, I call it capturing gray because I wanted to show the viewer even though you're seeing a vibrancy, it's a different tone or a little tint of gray in each of those colors or something or a color that will complement that grayish tone. I want to show it's not Barbados. It's another island or another space. I see that. And then what about their use of color and capturing gray throughout? Like when we're looking at the setting, right, of the subject um, in the middle of the space here and the blues and the greens as well. How do those colors impact um, what you're trying to portray. Is that you using Dominica only or are you using colors from Barbados and from other travels in this painting as well? When I went back to Barbados, you know, memory, memory is not solid. So a memory can, it, it can change, you know? So I try to remember Dominica coloring and because I was in Barbados, the lighting may affect me by my familiarity of the colors I'm used to. So when I did that, I tried to remind myself of that gray. So I always like to tell a story, like a storyteller. And I want to show the idea of being like a bird like be like escaping the cage but on the far left of the piece there's a bird still trapping a cage and there's a coconut tree so I just play with that idea of being I, I don't know the word sometimes stranded alienated that's the conceptual part but when it comes to technicality even though I have the greens and the pinks which I am familiar with I still try to go with that tonality of gray which I'm not familiar with Mm -hmm. And what about the use of shape? How does shape play into the roles in your paintings as well? Well, with shape, I, I realized that I use a lot of geometric shapes. 
Um, I really like um symmetry sometimes. I don't really go organic per se, and I like patterns. So with with shapes, I like flat shapes. I was watching a cartoon, Rocky and Bowinkle, because I was looking at that childhood memory of watching particular cartoons that have flatness that were created from the 60s. So while I apply on my work, I think of the 60s cartoons. I think of those old commercials, those old com uh, American commercials. So that's how those shapes and flatness come apart, um, come to play into my work. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Shana. You're um, welcome. Maybe we can look at some of Manyaku's work, and then I can also ask you some similar questions, uh, Manyaku, particularly a mm -hmm. uh, painting that is up right now at Moad, um, Grandmother's Teachings. Um, mm -hmm. I just mentioned, uh, yep, that one right there. Thank you. Um, I know you just mentioned you have a lot, or your influence comes a lot from fashion and design. And I feel like in particular, I see that here with um, the adornment in this painting, as well as some other ones. But I also see a lot of playing um, architectural in the background. Can you speak to that a little bit too? Yeah, um, so a lot of my paintings are also um, sort of me making sense of like growing up in the church that I grew up in and, and my religious upbringing. Uh, church for me was was outside. And um, the so the, a lot of the tones that I use in my work are, um, I inspired, or maybe I'm trying to replicate the tones that, like I, I you know, like the the soil that we sat on, or the uniform that we wear, that we wore, and things. And I think my relationship with like architecture and buildings is a is a is 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 a sensitive one to me. Um, my my father was very interested in 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 drawing, um, art, like. In, in plans, so drawing like um, buildings and architectures and stuff. And I remember he had like many poles and he would always like be testing out and um, drawing different plans and stuff in the house that I grew up in, which I always think of as a metaphor of like this dream of my whole family had like all these like line works. And so the line works of like everything and that 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 like inside sort of like um, um, architecture thing, it reminds me a lot of like his drawings, but it reminds me of like this plan towards like this dream of like a, a place that, that that you know, the place that you'd be in or going towards. Um, but also it reminds me a lot of like when I was in school and how that used to be like another form of church, but that was inside. And it, the, you know, the windows and, and, and the doors and stuff, the arches come from that, from a lot of like the Western institutions that like we sort of are in and have to, um, um, find some sort of spiritual connection to and so I think I'm always trying to play with like this sort of western architecture but re but twisted in such a way that it, it it feels like it's almost like have you seen those games that that sort of just have like the, these lines and 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 then you disappear like into the lines or whatever and I've always thought of that as like this like dream like space or a way to create this dream like space that feels very technological futurist but at the same time has these familiar shapes like the arches the windows and um the planes and the lines um I also wanted to feel like a plan not a finished building that you could like recognize and be like I could walk into, but I wanted to feel like, like, like I, I very, I wanted to be intentional about it being looking like a plan, looking like it's still like a drawing, it's still like this thing that's that's in progress or that is 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 not like quite finished yet, but has these familiar tones that or shapes and things that you can that you can identify with. Um, so with this work, particularly, I wanted to put this figure inside and some of my paintings, it feels like you're outside, but you're inside. I also want to blur those two things. Um, sometimes I want you to feel like you're looking outside a window or maybe you are in the painting or maybe you work the figure in it or you're outside. I think I'm trying to play with like where the figure is positioned in relation to the viewer, to the audience and where they would position themselves there. So with this painting specifically, I wanted it to feel like she's inside, but that this was 
quite an important room that she was into and that was holding a lot of information. Um, but that outside there was also this this really like dreamlike thing happening outside. And that the outside world was another thing that you could engage with, but that it's quite it's a bit further away, um, a little out of reach, but yeah, I don't know if that, that makes sense, but um yeah. I, I totally see that. I mean, I feel like, you know, this painting has so much dimension to it from the subject being so in the forefront of the architectural background. Um, mm -hmm. But actually looking at the subject, is this a self-portrait? It is a self-portrait. Uh -huh. It is a self-portrait. Uh, yeah. And what about... I, sorry? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think when I started painting, I started painting myself a lot. Um, because I just, there were so many things I needed to figure out, skin tone, I needed to figure out like expression and I thought like I was the best to do it. Um, but a lot of the times my self portraits don't end up looking like me. <laughs> and I thought there was something interesting in, in that in how um, like I really wanted to, to, to create a certain kind of like expression in the face. So the way that I would like change the lighting of the, so I, I draw from photo references of people or me or my family. Um, some photos I've collected off the internet. Some people recognize themselves or recognize a friend, but then I'm like, is it really? And then they'll look back at the picture and be like, actually, no, the nose is different. But I'm really interested in like, exaggerating features, exaggerating lips, exaggerating the nose, um, exaggerating the lights in the face so it maybe um, brings in a certain tension around the eyebrows or even just thickening the eyebrows sometimes creates a very masculine um, face which then blurs the gender of the person. Um, so yeah, the, the, this is a self-portrait but also not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's very interesting. You talking about where you pull inspiration from for the individuals that are in your works. Sheena, can I ask you also, you know, I've seen many of your different paintings, right? Um, some of them being athletes, some of individuals at leisure in their home. Where are you pulling inspiration from when it comes to looking at the individuals in your works as well? Well, just like my, my Yuku, um, I used to do a lot of self portraits and my paintings, and I got quite tired of painting myself. So I just decided to use figures that I found on Pinterest, and most of the time they were like models. So I would just use their silhouette, and then I would hide their face with an afro. Uh, why an afro? Because I, I like natural hair, but I always wanted thick hair, but just the idea of just giving like a mask, just that you want to see my face or you could identify who's that and who's that person and you just see your lips. Um, so my reference really come from when I go on Pinterest and I find like models. And then because I have a condition called lupus, um, these athletes came about in my, in my work, um, I believe last year, when with lupus is an autoimmune disease that the body attack itself. And I can't do hard exercises. I can only do swimming and yoga. So I used to do kickboxing just for fun. And then I noticed I was getting bad joint pains. So eventually when I did my first sports pieces, it was just for fun. I was actually looking at disco people. And I said, they look like tennis players. So I decided to put some tennis rackets in their hand, but I like the aesthetic, the colors of a tennis court. It's very 70s with the orange and the green. And then everyone was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So eventually I started looking at more athletes, I started to look at their strategies and I started to look at like more so black athletes and black women. So me that cannot do hard exercises, it just imagining in their position, but also strategizing and navigating as an artist in the art world. So that's where my references go from just getting tired drawing my face, from now studying and acknowledging af Black athletes, but also with fulfillment to be in a position in a house with luxury as a Black woman from the Caribbean. So it, it deal with class and politics and culture and so on. You know, that's interesting you're talking about the face. Um, and I've noticed that 
a lot of the works are the faces are quite anonymous, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more detail about why they're not their faces aren't as detailed. I I just didn't want to. I tried my earlier work with pen and ink when they add eyes, it it come across a little creepy. Um, I tried thinking of a nose, but the nose is like somewhat a definite of this is a person that I recognize this is that and that and that so I was like how am I going to create an avatar, an avatar by not letting them be recognized or look like I know that person so the best and safest way for now still trying to figure it out um how just to create a being a figure an avatar just figures doing action so at this moment i would change the lips but i do get nervous when i put the lips a bit too pink i don't want it to be like one of those old cartoons that were offended so i am still conscious of respecting the black figure and not making it exaggerated i mostly think of my lips so when i first started the athletes, I mean, the, the beings or figures, they had black lips at the top and then the bottom would be pink. So I was trying to imitate my lips, but then I tried to be more comfortable putting more pink lips, putting brown lips. You would be surprised how just changing the lips of trying not to be offensive. Um, I understand that. And then even also, Sheena, I'm looking at and looking at the various paintings, the various complexions that we see as well, right? Like mm -hmm. I love seeing that because, you know, Black people are not monoliths and our complexions are very um, varied. Uh, yes. Can we talk a little bit about your use of color and complexion here? So when it comes to the color, um, again, with lupus, when I started to use my medicine, it started to make me become darker. So looking in the mirror, even though I have the same nose, same mouth, same eyes, it had me like still not seeing myself. And it was like asking myself, is it okay to be darker or telling myself it's okay to be darker? So I also did performance art about that idea about getting darker. So what I did is I did some pieces of gymnastics and gymnasts and they dive into different browns, browns with yellow, browns with purple, browns with green. Just telling myself, accept yourself. You see the gymnast diving into your skin tone. So now you will see very of the black figures with green in the more or maybe perhaps pink or purple but to be honest I'm still very uncomfortable to paint a lighter skin because I am not sure I I don't know how it feels to be lighter so I try to imagine or tell myself there are black people in this complexion so I varies and play with the the tonalities of giving myself permission to add more blue, more orange, just exaggerate it or go for it. Thank you. Um, and Yaku, how do you feel about the various complexions or creating various complexions in your paintings? Um, what does that look like for you over time? What does that look like today? Um, I think I, I <laughs> firstly, I, I was, I, my background from, I used to use like pencil. All my drawings used to be like black and white. Mm -hmm. And I liked like this very high contrast sort of thing, but I didn't, before I started painting in color, I didn't have to consider like skin color. But, and so when I started doing my self portraits, I found that I would, I was adding quite a lot of contrast and they would um, end up being a lot darker because of, wanting to like find these tensions in in the face because I really wanted the gaze and and how and 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 sort of like the stance of the face to be very specific um but then I started adding like a lot more highlights and I think depending on the pose sometimes it can be very soft and sometimes it can be very like exaggerated um and I think I've also gone through a journey with skin tone um I, I try to stay true to the, to the reference that I'm working with um, a lot of the times. But recently, I've, I've been adding this red clay in my paint um, and using that as a base or trying to create to use that to create the texture. 
And when you mix it with the white, it brings all these pink tones in and it brings like this like really um, like softness to the skin, which then um, changes it a bit. So I don't know, I'm like, I, with skin tone, it changes all the time for me, depending on like how, who I'm working with and how I sort of want their presence to be felt in the work. Um, and I, you know, I try very hard to like make it one tone across the board, but um, it's difficult. It's, I don't think that is, is, is honest. If to be honest, like to make one tone across the board, I think um, it, there are people who do it very intentionally, but with me, I think it just goes with what I'm trying to, to, with what, with the feeling of the painting, how I want it to be. If, um, also because my figures are sort of sitting in this nowhere place and it's mostly black, it's mostly dark, um, they are very dark tones. There are these dark shadows that sit on the skin tone. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's interesting. When I do highlights, I try to use red though. I think it's, I think that there's a lot of red in our skin too. And um, when I work, because of all the red ink I use and because of the red clay, the way it also stains my skin, I sometimes use that as reference to try and like bring those highlights in. So um, my most recent work now in my show, in my upcoming show, there's a lot of red in the skin. Um, it's it's becoming like, it's I'm, I'm being a little bit less, I'm being more unapologetic about representing red skin. Um, I think we have a lot of red tones in there that we haven't really like um, looked into or I, I haven't really looked into. And I'm interested to see like what those tones can do as a skin color. So inventing things as well, I think. It, you know, you're talking about the red and I see that mm -hmm. like I'm looking at some of the works from 2022 versus 2023. In the 2020 mm -hmm. works, I see this red or this clay color that you're, you know, it's a through line. It's in the background. It's when grandmother's mm -hmm. teaching you're wearing um what does that color mean to you is there an emotional connection to that color is there a direct tie to that color in home in cape mm -hmm. town um can you share a little bit about that yeah i think yes um not so long ago i actually sat down with myself and i looked around and this color was all around me and i realized that like this is the color that reminds me of home a lot um, my grandmother had a really big stoop, which is sort of like the front veranda of the house. This is where um, like the congregation meets after church or if we're visiting, that's where everyone sits on the stoop to to. And I remember the the I have a fun memory of my grandmother before she passed and all of us sitting on that stoop before they changed it up. Um, but also the stoop, it's that color and it's staying that color. And I just remember as a young girl um, polishing and readying the stoop for like guests to come and the labor like involved in there. Um, but then also the joy that everyone got in like sitting on there and just how much like community it, it held. It's almost like this entrance point. Um, but also it's the same color that is used across um, Africa in, in in rites of passage ceremonies. It's 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 this this um, clay that is rubbed on the skin of like initiates before or during that transitional pa uh, phase where they're 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 in this coming of age ceremony or they're in this you know a, a rite of passage ceremony where they're they're going from one thing to another and throughout that 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 phase or that transitional space they 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 put this color on their skin um and i just thought that was really i mean when i think back about um i didn't go through that process because we were um we went to church but when I look at pictures of it, I just got this book by Peter Magubani and um, I was so happy I found it because already I was thinking about skin tone as red. But then when I saw where this color sort of like, um, I was like, this color holds so much knowledge. There's so much knowledge systems in this. There's the knowledge of, you know, how to clean the stoop to, to the knowledge of like um, how to be a woman or to, so I named this one grandmother's teaching because I felt like this color came came 
back to me a lot when I was thinking of home, of the actual color of the sand and 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 um, but it's also, I mean, here in Cape Town, the Tosa women um would put imbola is what they call it on their faces. They smear it on their faces, you rub it in like water and you smear it on your faces as a protection um against the sun. Um and so it has all these uses that color is. For me, I'm very intentional about color um, because I come from a place where color represents so many spiritual phases and and um, signifies where you're at in your womanhood, manhood, spirituality, location, you know. And so um, this color specifically I found came up a lot for me. And so started being very intentional about using it more and more and yeah, it's 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 a pretty lit color. <laughs> really, we're excited for your uh, show coming up to see how we see this color come back up again. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, maybe incorporating colors? And Sheena, maybe you can answer this first. Incorporating colors uh, in your paintings that you may not necessarily feel so drawn to, but you want to see it show up in your works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're talking about the inspiration from uh, Barbados, for example, Sheena, but I know that we may have discussed a bit colors that you want to exper experiment with and want to see it more in your paintings. How does that impact what you're working on or what would you like to see uh, in your future works? Um, Barbados is a very colorful place. So in, sometimes in Isla, you might see a sunset, you might see a, a random chicken and maybe a random beach. So I just want to give a sense. I didn't get a chance to take pictures of houses, even though they're everywhere. The weather been somewhat strange. So uh, I didn't get time to catch her house. But just to give you an idea, Barbados is colorful. So color was always there in my work, always. Like even when I did some town drawings and pen and ink with architecture, there's a bit of color that will pop up sometimes. But then I really embraced color when I started to paint, paint. And when I said paint, paint, I mean like really using acrylic paints and so on like that. But what happened when I went to Panama last year, Um, I saw this artist and I wrote down his name, Julio Zach, Zach Prison. Um, Pan Panamanian artist and his his work gave me permission that's okay to use these particular colors together. I would never think to use brown, orange, green, and maybe blue together. I maybe would never I think use purple, red, and then suddenly a dark green. Um, his work just gave me permission. It gave me life. I was like, wow, I never thought of putting these colors before. He, you know, are also thinking about tonalities, even though these are supposed to be vibrant colors, he will like mute the tonality as well, or he will heighten one color and then lower the next. So when I was in Panama for a week with my mom, they also had these ladies, I tend to call the Mula ladies. Um, they walk around, they're indigenous women, and they're walking around with bees on their feet all over their hands. They just have color and color, but also they're known for doing, I think Mula or Mulu women. I forgive me for if I got the name wrong, but they're very well known in Panama. And they stitch a lot of fabrics and design on top. So I think after that trip, that they give me permission to exaggerate colors. So this painting behind me, I would never think of using such bright colors together like this. Like if you're puking out the rainbow or something, and then all of a sudden you got this really dark figure behind, like heavy contrast suddenly. So it was like trying to break the rules of tonalities and complementary colors, but also, also remembering to use the complementary colors. So I would say that I am having fun with the work, um, but I'm trying to break, oh, someone said more or less. Right, there you go. So <laughs> thank you. So this is the thing. So like for me, I'm having fun, but um, I also want the work to get uglier 
it's like that what i'm battling with by the idea of the beauty and the aesthetic again look through my window i see very bright colors but now i'm trying to like ugly what uglyfy the colors together does that exist can you make colors be ugly together that's where i am at with the work thank you Manyaka, do you have anything to add about that? I'm curious to know if you think about that too when using color or colors that you may not necessarily be drawn to but want to see it in your works. Um, yeah, sometimes I, I, I mean, a lot of the times I am not as brave as she A lot of the times I, I mean, um, there are so many layers to my work. Um, and sometimes you'll find that I tried to experiment with like a green or I tried to, and it just, it, it became too overwhelming. And then I will just, and, and, and then the plane becomes like completely black. Um, and I don't know, I've, I've, I've become, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with, with, with black. Um, I'm, I think I, I'm adding it more and more. If ever in doubt, I'm like, it can be like a completely black space. And there's a lot of work in, in making large scale work that has a lot of black in it. There's a lot of different like tones, the way the light hits it, the way, the way it, it, it just doesn't sit still. It does so many different things. And um, so, yeah, I think, um, like the a, a color that is 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 um difficult for me to use was also blue. I didn't know how to use blue. I was like, it's it's just like you know. Um, but I did. I I started using it as a garment. Um, and in a way that it felt like a thread or it felt like a very small detail, almost reminds me of some of the beadwork. And it's it's funny that she does talk about beadwork because I was thinking about the beadwork and, and the significance of that within spiritual um garments um here in South Africa. Um and so that 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 detail, I wanted the detail then to be subtle, but like in 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 this blue that you know if you looking at it, it may look like white but if you really look at it you'll find that there's blue i also want people to find the colors in things sometimes i'll put like a little green moon and you won't really pay attention to it but if you're really looking someone will be like whoa there's like a little green moon in there or there's a little purple um line in there and it's just like i want people to look that long and and look past the, the like not past but to spend so much time in the blackness that then they find that little speck um I used to use a lot of gold and I'm using gold less and less now um as I'm getting more comfortable into like color I think I'm really I'm someone who loves black <laughs> it's just <laughs> like I just I would everything would be black in my paintings but um I also really love earth tones I think the tones that for me that keep coming up for me is is how the ground looks after it's rained or how the 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 mountain looks as the sun is like setting. We have like the most amazing mountains here also in South Africa and the the way the sun sets and 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 how it looks it's it's like incredible. Not so long ago there was a really big fire here on the on Table Mountain and the colors that were coming from that, it was so devastating, but so beautiful. And I just kept thinking about like this red and this red, but I also, um, I like the colors to move. So sometimes in a lot of the washes, you'll find the, the, and the colors that I'm not very comfortable in, 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 in being like so, deliberate about you'll find the greens in the washes and you'll find the 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 pinks and the purples in the washes they they're there they're very subtle but they're there and i think I'll, as um as i find out what the colors mean to me i think i will then be more intentional about using them um it's interesting you brought up um table mountain and cape town because i mm. feel like some of your works, you know, you, it's almost like you brought the outside into your paintings, even when mm -hmm. we're looking at others' teachings. Like I think about the landscape in Cape Town, how um, 
Do you see that in your work also? Is that something that I'm noticing or is that something, is that something intentional in what I'm looking at in the works? Like for example, grandmother's teachings here. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the the figures are now becoming the place. I've always mm-hmm. thought of 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 a place as not having any not not having significance, but that people make the place. And sometimes, because the people make the place, the place then has so much weight and politics and all these things. But it's really like the, those two things are very intertwined. Um, where I come from, spiritual ceremonies happen in caves, in mountains. That is almost a, a, a portal where people go to, 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 to es- not escape, but to enter another realm where they can, where they get messages, where they find healing, where they bring sort of this power back and strength back to where they, they are then staying. So um, the there are some mountains that are being mined and people are not able to practice and do their things there anymore. And so it makes me feel like they're killing a part of these people. And so I've very intentionally started to make the people the place. And the I guess the aesthetically the thing was 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 then to make the garments sort of become the the mountains. But you'll see as the work, I think now more recently, there are now layers as well. The landscape starts with the figure. And then as you look into it, the landscape then becomes like a real landscape. But um, yeah, it's very intentional. I want them to look big. I want them to take on the stature of a landscape of a mountain. Um, so I, I I fill it with so much color because I wanted to suck you in. I wanted to overpower you in its in its color, but also in its shape and in its size. Um, and that's why I put the figures right at the front is so you, they sort of like encase you first before you get to the, the, the landscape behind. Thank you. I, hope, I think that answered your question, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, thank you, Manyaku. Sheena, you know, can we also talk a little bit about um, the seduction or the power of seduction and using color, you know, wanting to um, evoke a particular emotional response from individuals, right? And their choice of what you use. I think we talked a little bit about that briefly before, but can we go into a little bit more detail about how you use that in your works? I think you're on mute, Sheena. Oh, sorry. Um, So the question is about the color and seduction. Yes. You know, how you think um, color impacts like your psychological interaction with the works. Okay. Uh, you're Hi, I'm back. So, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So right. if we could go back to like capturing grid, let's see. Oh, let's go to the one with the footballers, with the three guys. And then we could go to one with the flowers, just to give a bit of a background story. Um, let's go, sorry, let's go with the one with the ladies sitting with the dolls and the flowers. So to give you a background story and the idea of um the idea of seduction. There she is. You see the slideshow? The the lady laying down and she got flowers around her and a dog. There you go. Yeah. So I mentioned Panama. And I mentioned about how it gave me permission to go with ugly colors. No, you can stay right there. Um, Thank you. This piece called My Condolences. And I was listening to Mayuku and she was talking about her grandmother and her family. Most of my time I was talking about the technicality and thinking about how to approach colors. In this particular piece, this piece called My Condolences, I did this piece on the day of my father's funeral. And usually my work is very diaristic. My work is very bold. It's very in your face. And because of lupus, I had to reduce my tension, my anger, my sadness, any form of emotion in me. And I use these paintings as a therapeutic way of being balanced and being flatlined. 
So I mostly look at the technicality of colors to help my autoimmune be settled and in remission. But I admire and somewhat get jealous of the athletes of getting very passionately um, physically. This piece called my condolence because this lady is sitting around a lot of flowers around her. These are the actual flowers we received when my dad had died. The dog is when I went to get, uh, Mexico and they believe I asked someone a question before my dad died. I went to Mexico City. I asked them a question. Why are there so many dogs around, around Mexico? The one guy answered me and said, and maybe the audience may have an answer, but they believe that when a dog die, the dog your the dog you own will be on the other side waiting on you, and the dog will be guiding you to the maker, and then the maker will decide if to say you're good enough to go to heaven or you go back. I put a dog there as a guidance. I put a dog there as a reference of my dog of my dad passing, and just use it as a symbol of. And I acknowledge you're gone, but this dog may lead me to the other side. The flowers are what we receive, and then the colors. I would have never, as I mentioned about puking the colors, I would have never put a brown background with a yellow, an intense yellow like that. I would have never put a purple and a brown and a yellow like that. But the emotion I had of my dad passing, I had to find a way to internalize that and put it on, on the surface. <laughs> Someone laughing, must be at church. So mm -hmm. I have given myself permission to say it's okay. It's mm -hmm. okay to let go. Acknowledge your situation, but also it's okay to pour your heart, heart out with color. So coming back with this idea of seduction, I wanted the piece to be attractive. So I wanted to like push and pull. And I guess all artists do that idea, pushing you away and pulling you in. So I was doing that with the color, with the brown pulling you in and pushing you away with all the busyness and colors of the flowers, the abundance. Now, if we go to the slide before that with the three footballers, that piece called skin and it's the red ground. The red ground, three footballers. You should see it very soon. There, there you go. So this piece was done before my condolences. This is when I went to Mexico City and I saw the ground just like Mayuku, how she mentioned about the clay. It's just so funny that when I did this piece, I was thinking about the tonality, not just on the skin, but it's similar to what I mentioned about capturing gray, trying to catch that gray Dominica. Well, when I went to Mexico by the pyramid, they had a session with the reddish ground. And I just was thinking about the community. When I went to Cuba in 2012, it was really interesting to see the footballers, the community, the neighborhood, how they were cheering on with each other. In this case here, the figures came from Pinterest of three male models in separate photos. And I want to be poetic, but I also want to be showing the accuracy or the my like thinking of how to hit this ball. So I wanted one guy to look like if he calculating to see how he's going to hit the ball and the other guy in the back acknowledging them and admiring what they're about to do. So again, the idea of seduction in the sense of capturing you with the concept, but also the colors of even though they're flat, how can I give that sense of warmth but yet cold, the push and the pull? How can I create depth? And how can it create still the flatness? So seduction so to me in the sense of attraction, but also the psychological of space and how to draw you or make you if you're physically there. So I still researching the word seduction, um, not just the obvious, but the word of drawing in. Hmm. I get that. Thank, thank you, Sheena. Um, and Yaku, did you have anything you wanted to add before we do some Q&A from the uh, virtual audience? Um, no, I just, I agree with Sheena. I think for me, her colors just, I get so lost in, in those colors. And I was thinking about um, when I started sort of um, painting these solid colors with the, the sort of negative space, I I also thought about scale and how the scale of like these these solid colors can really like evoke so much like emotion in someone. And I think um, 
uh yeah I love Sheila's work so much just the, that's my I favorite love your work too. the three but the I three love your work people, I'm like they are so cool <laughs> yeah your work is amazing your work's amazing <laughs> uh, speaking of your works both being amazing there are a few um audience members who have said love your work such an inspiration um, for up and coming artists. So thank you both for doing what you're doing. Um, you. As black women, we really appreciate everything you're bringing to the table and shaping the art world and your use of color. Um, one question uh, first is from Kijo. Uh, for Sheena, Kijo asked, my condolences, is that in conversation with Micheline Thomas's work at all? I love Micheline Thomas work, love her work. I feel so honored sometimes when I get to show with her. Micheline Thomas work was my inspiration a long time ago, but when I did that particular piece, unfortunately, I would say thank you for the condolence. Uh, unfortunately, not in this case. In this case, I was thinking of more like collagen, and I was thinking of more like just Again, questioning, even though that was a cruise, I'm not going to cry, but I literally painted on his day on his funeral. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to show, it's a frustration of having an autoimmune disease and you can't fully express how you feel. It's very, very, very suffocating. So what I did is try to show the prettiness trying to show, even though it was sad, trying to add some form of sense of humor to, I had a very dark sense of humor at that period. So it wasn't Micheline Thomas at that time. It was just, just, just letting it out, just pouring whatever colors that were coming out at that time. Thank you, Sheila, for sharing that. Um, Thank you. Minyaku, uh, would you say that the fine lace and line in your work and your paintings reflect your relationship to fashion and sewing? Or, and could you also explain how you create such delicate lines um, in your works? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I love the idea of, of like scarification and, 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 and the whole thing behind that um, marking where you are in your life um, as it also been like some sort of challenge for you to get through something. So it, when I started making these marks, I was thinking about um, marking where I was at as or where this, this character is at as an armor. Um, and so, but yeah, my relationship with fashion is I love textile. And I I love specifically the, you know, when you're pulling like a woven fabric apart and how the threads sort of start to like fizzle out like that. Um, I love that. And, and, and those lines, we had this exercise at school. We had to replicate sometimes what the fabric was doing. And we had to like transfer that into a drawing. And I got really into that. And so a lot of times I'm trying to create my own garments but I also want to show that they're not they're not like compact or like put together they're coming apart they're they're constantly just um just integrating or and you know there are moments where like they do come together but then a lot of the times they're just sort of like unraveling um and are open and and I also wanted to feel like an armor I wanted to I want all the characters to feel like they're wearing this armor over to protect or um yeah um I also I use these um acrylic pens and so that I guess that's where my drawing comes in um and that uh, this is this repetitive meditative thing for me, um, I was listening to Sheila talk about how, you know, the intention of trying to, to, to put all of that like, feeling and find like a meditative way of like expressing like your emotions. So those lines for me are also that they're very meditative. It's the repetition of it. Sometimes you, you get lost in it and I can't work without music. And a lot of that is guided with music too. Um, I sometimes just, 
I have like pages and pages and pages where I'm I'm just I'm just doodling lines. Um and I like the the composition of lines too. They do so much. Sometimes they look like fingerprints, sometimes they look like you know, mappings of mountains. Sometimes they look like um like a vortex. You know, people have so many different ways that they relate to this composition of like these free flowing lines. Sometimes they look like textures of a fabric. So I love all of that. And um yeah, I would think I'll have to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I say it too much sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um I think we may have a couple more questions. Oh, someone asked uh, Sheena, could you say who the artist you mentioned earlier, Julio, if you could say their last Jul name? Julio, I got it written down. Julio Zach Christon, Z A C H R I S S O N. The first name is J U L I O. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but you know what I was also thinking about? How you name your works. Um, is there something, is there a science to it or your works named it maybe after inspired by music? Um, of course, you know, your experiences, like my condolences, like you mentioned before, um, Sheena. And Yaku, how do you name your works? And then Sheena, if you want to talk about other works you've named too, that would be great. Um, um, yeah, I, my own majority of my works are named after songs. Um, I, there's just, there's always music in, in, in my studio. I can't work without it. And sometimes I'll hear a lyric and I'll jump up, write it on the wall. So my walls are also just full of random quotes <laughs> from different songs. And so when I'm titling, I look up and there's this like, um, archive of like, of, of quotes on the wall that happened or that triggered something while I was making work. And, and, and that's what, so grandma, the grandmother's teachings, um, I think we're talking about this is is from see, I didn't I didn't do my thing and write it down like um No Withers. No Withers. No Withers, but it's actually <laughs> it was grandmother's uh is it grandmother's I I will I will get it for you because I remember yes. grandmother letter or something. Let's see. I'm not in my studio. Um, yes, it's on my wall. But also I made that work a while ago and I've moved studios since. But that's what I I title my works after. Songs, um, sometimes um quotes from like a movie in in like songs. I like playlists from from movies and things as well. So um that's where my titles come from. Thank you. And Sheena, how about my titles can come Sometimes very random, not from music. I find that sometimes you may see me on IG dance around playing music, but majority of the time I am listening to a lot of reality shows and a lot <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of like news. But truth be told, <laughs> when I, some like for instance, salt is a good example. The piece that is in Moran. Um, Salt really came from, and I wrote down her name, um, came from a book called When We Were Birds, named a, a Trinidadian writer named Ayana Loy Banwo. Um, it was a really interesting book, and it's about this girl, this lady that her family is into, like, Afro spirituality, and the sea spirits, well, the guy, he, his family is in, into Rastafari, but he really needed money, so he chopped off his locks and went and worked in the grave site, um, being a grave digger, and the mother was not happy about that, um, so I'm not going to spoil it for anyone, but eventually, there was a part in the book that had me thinking when the girl spoke to the guy and he said, Black people back in the day, I'm not sure when, maybe let's say slavery time, um, used to fly, but it ate so much salt, too much salt, that they can't fly anymore. So it had me thinking that evening while reading this book, it had me thinking are we still flying? Can we still fly? Have we ate too much salt? Have we ate a lot of salt? Have, have we become heavy? 
So with that particular piece that's in the exhibition, um, I was just thinking about the colonial colors of like when you think of the library, one of old fashioned libraries, how they have the library green. And then I, again, as I mentioned, getting the figures, these random figures on um, magazines and Vogue and Pinterest. And I would use their form to shape them out and make them look very, you know, like they got a dollar, you, you know? <laughs> I was just thinking along that line of black women, black people, because some figures you can't tell if they're men or women, but the idea of their position and being in a high position, and instead of reflecting about how we were affected by slavery, how can we still surpass that or get into a, a position, you know? And behind the figures are Argentina. That is me thinking about how can I get to Argentina? I would love to see their mountains. So it's that idea literally flying to Argentina. So that question about Black people can we fly? So that's how salt came together as the title of reading this book, When We Were Birds, questioning about Black people that um, if we are capable to fly, which I believe, but do we loosen up on the salt? You know, so that way call it salt. Thank you. Um, I think we have one last question from an audience member, because uh, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. But Michael's uh, made a comment. He said, I love how the fabric and Manyaku's work becomes armor. Uh, Sheena, does hair serve the same purpose in your works? That is a very good question. I see hair as a form of movement, especially when the figures are in action. For me, I see the hair as not just identity. That's a very, very good question. I never see it as armor. I see it more like an identity of, yes, this is a black person and texture, but also I just imagine like, you know, as a little girl, you had a dolly and you see the ponytail and you wish you had the long hair. It's just a form of uh, simplifying it as I wish I had thick hair. I love, I have a big giant wig. I could just sneak in and show you. So I just got like these weird wish fulfillments to have gigantic hair. So I made wigs out of gigantic hair. So it's just a weird wish, wish fulfillment to have big hair. So yeah, so I, I hope that could answer you to some degree. It's not as fast the answer, but I'm trying to be as honest about the hair. So here's a hair for example. I love so that. that <laughs> <laughs> so this is a hair in bed. So I just love the hair. That's um, all. That's stunning. That is stunning. Um, <laughs> I well, I, I want to say, um, because, you know, I know it's, you know, like 10 o'clock in Cape Town. And, and uh, so, Sheena, I know you want to get on with your day and be cognizant of other people's time. But Thank you all for taking part in this conversation. Sheena and Manyaku, it has been a pleasure to um, be speaking with the two of you about your works. Um, I look forward to seeing what everyone does in the future and to going to see the show more and more and more. And Elizabeth, thank you also um, for giving us this platform. Thank you all so much. Oh my gosh. For this. Thank you guys so much. This was so fun. I was so nervous, but actually this was so fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate all three of you so much bringing um, everything that you brought to this conversation and telling us so much about your process and your thoughts um, and really enriching our experience of this exhibition spectrum on color and contemporary art. Um, I do wanna let people know that uh, on February 8th, and I know it feels far away, but February is gonna be here before we know it. We're gonna have another um, Spectrum artist talk, and this time it will be in person at MOAD with the artist Delita Martin and Tani Chapman. Um, so that'll be at MOAD on February 8th. We would love to have anybody who's near or in the Bay Area join us for that. Um, we also love to hear your feedback. Um, so if you could please take a moment to fill out an online program survey. I know um, that should be in the chat as well as it should pop up after you close this browser. 
Um, we work hard at MOAD and we would love for you to support the work that you, we do. So um, if anybody out there is not a member and would like to support artists like Manyaku and Sheena and gallerists like Jonathan and the work we do at MOAD, please become a member or um, give us a donation of any amount. We appreciate every kind of support. And if you are in the Bay Area, uh, please do come and see this spectacular show, Spectrum on Color and Contemporary Art at MOAD. It'll be on view through March 3rd. Um, so we look forward to seeing everybody at MOAD or on future um, virtual programs. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys later. Bye. Thank you.